Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the New Books in Animal Studies, a podcast channel on the New Books Network. I am Marcela Hernandez, a PhD candidate in philosophy at the University of Frankfurt, and I will be the host of the channel today with an interview to one of the leading voices in animal history, Dr. Nigel Rothfels, who recently published the book Elephant Trails, A History of Animals and Cultures. Dr. Rothfels, Welcome to the show, and thank you for being here. Thank you, Marcella. It's nice to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah, it's great to have you. Um, first, I wanted to tell you, um, to ask you uh, if you could tell us about yourself a little bit. How has your own history led to you, uh, led you to become interested in animals and zoos, and specifically then elephants? Mm, thank you. Well, um... You know, I think sometimes, uh, you know, people ask you how long you, you know, took to write a, a book or something. And uh, the answer is always, you know, my whole life, um, because you're never, you're always working towards it. And um, I don't know, when I was a child, um, my, um, it was my thing to go to the zoo. I don't know why that is. Uh, it was something that, um, uh I got to do in a family of other children, and I was the youngest. Uh, so if the family was traveling, um, maybe it was a way for me to own everyone's behavior for a little while and make them do what I wanted to do. But for whatever reason, that became sort of part of my early sort of ideas about what I enjoyed. Um, and um, and also kind of obsessed about nature programming on television when I was growing up. Um, so I don't know. I, I when I went to college, I decided to study biology, um, and then unfortunately took a history class, and my course changed. Um, and then I went to grad school, not really knowing what I was going to do. Um, I went to Harvard University, and I, I think I, you know, talked a little bit about wanting to study European history or something like that when I applied. Um, when it came time to picking a dissertation topic, um, um, the recommendation of one of my faculty was that I choose something I just really enjoy. <laughs> um, and, um, and so I started thinking more about the history of biology um, and the history, especially of natural history. Um, and, um, and then I thought of zoos. And when I proposed this idea, I think, honestly, um, People were a little perplexed about whether that's a good idea or not. Um, and um, uh, But again, um, when it came down to um, being excited about the work that was, I was going to do, um, it sort of began to make a lot of sense that I would study zoos and history and Europe and possibly especially Germany um, uh, in mostly the 19th century. And I think I've been mostly in the 19th century since, um, uh, at least, you know, more maybe up to World War I. Um, and so that's where my graduate work began. Um, and then after getting my PhD, um, I wrote a dissertation that was essentially about Carl Hagenbeck uh, and, uh, and his business. Um, and, um, and I really encourage people not to read my dissertation. Um, uh, I am one of many, uh, I think, who uh, um, was very happy to see that in the past. Um, but um, when it came time to revise my dissertation, um, uh, um, I, 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 I went about it uh, fairly uh, a fairly significant revision and 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 then really began to enjoy the work i think that's when i really began to enjoy writing um and um, so it's a normal thing not to enjoy the process of writing a dissertation right <laughs> dissertations the, the, the kind of expectations around dissertations the i don't know maybe this is just my experience i sort of sometimes found writing a dissertation of being about lowering the bar every day about what one <laughs> about what one thought one was going to write um and um and but writing books is something different that's that's about 
having the opportunity to write what one really loves. That's great to hear. Ideally. <laughs> and uh, how did you come specifically to write Elephant Trails? Can you point to something like an origin for this particular book? Sure. I think one of the earliest um, images that I found uh, when I was working on my zoo work uh, was a image of a little elephant that was captured in the field, um, and it was the photograph was taken of him with uh, his mother after his mother had been uh, shot by the um, hunter, and so it was before he had been captured, and. Um, I was just really um, taken aback by the image um, and uh, and the kind of horror of it, honestly. Um, I ended up using that image in my first book, in um, Savages and Beasts. Um, uh, I didn't use it in this book, but it is the <laughs> that image uh, and the story of that particular elephant really is the background of this whole project. So that takes me back then. Um, uh, so you, you need to notice I did my dissertation research um, in the late 80s, the late 1980s. So we're talking, you know, um, uh, more than 20, more than 30 years ago, sorry, <laughs> uh, when I found that image um, uh, 35 years ago, I probably found that image. And um, Uh, it's sort of stayed with me. And, and I, I have to say, um, my feelings about the person who photographed that elephant have changed a lot over time. Um, the way I wrote about him when I wrote my first book is not how I would write about him today. Um, but, um, but that image stayed with me. And I thought I had sort of imagined it would be wonderful just to do kind of a biography of that elephant. And then um, when I settled on that concept, um, I realized that it was going to be a, a book that uh, is um, in which that individual elephant's uh, life is only a very, very tiny spot. I think it happened. I think I talk about it maybe just in a few pages in the introduction, um, but otherwise, it's uh, it's a it's it's but it's throughout. Yeah. Good. Um... Will you begin your book with a story that appears in the Urana, one of the canonical texts where the teachings of the Gautama Buddha were written? Um, the Buddha is told that some wanderers of various sects came to the village and began discussing religious truths. This prompted him to tell the parable of the blind man and the elephant. Can you tell us this story and why you chose it, as I take it, as the basic premise of your book? Oh, thank you. Um... Oh, I love these questions. Thanks, Marcella. <laughs> um, it's a profound story. Uh, I think it's one of those stories that's been um, in um, uh, that's that's with us <laughs> in ways, even if we don't know the story. It's a story about our ability to know things, um, especially very, very um, profound and complex things, um, and. Um, Right, so people probably know the story is that, that uh, you know that these um, that this group of blind men put their hands on an elephant um, and are asked what they what what an elephant is, and each describes the elephant differently because each is seen, if you will, uh, just a part of the elephant. Um, and the the Buddha says that um, uh, that the followers of the various sects are are like these men they each see a part of the truth but because that's only what the, the that part is the only part they see they think they see the whole thing um and so for me as an historian um i think what i wanted to write about and the reason uh that Uh, the image is on the cover of the book, and and um, and as you're you're right, it's a theme that goes through the whole book. Is that historically um, we are seeing always only a small part of what an elephant is, um, and what we see has very much to do with our individual position, um, and uh, so not just where we are with our hands on the elephant, but where we are historically, where we are culturally um, and over time. So um, part two of 
the, the lesson of the blind man and the elephant, I believe, is that um, there is a way to imagine all those um, uh, impressions of the elephant, of the truth, all those partial um, visions of truth as um, as together constituting something closer to the whole truth, um, that we'll never know what an elephant <laughs> is thinking, what an elephant really is. But um, I do believe that we are getting closer to a, a deeper understanding. Um, and, uh, and that's part of a you know, a kind of optimistic historical trajectory um, that I'm probably disinclined to mostly accept, um, but I also believe it's it's sort of true. I think we are, in fact, um, more aware of um, the lives and minds and thoughts of elephants, even though they're something that we'll never truly understand. We are we're closer than we have been in the past. Yeah, and we're probably um still beginning to imagine certain things about animals in general and elephants specifically that we uh, couldn't imagine before so the image of the elephant uh, is changing and can change and uh, it's not just what we see now but what we could see in the future I think that's interesting I think that's also. That's absolutely in your book. right. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And I think, um, I hope also that uh, a lesson of the book is about humility and about our ability to understand history and understand ourselves, that it's always partial and incomplete. Um, and our ability to understand elephants is always partial and incomplete. Um, and that the worst things that have happened to elephants over time, I think, have happened because people thought they knew all about them. Um, and and so I think partly um, what I wanted to get to by the end of the book is for people to not think that they know everything there is to know about an elephant. Mm -hmm. Once you think you know about something or someone, then you think you can dominate this person or thing. That's like the premise of uh, colonial thought and practices. Well, I mean, that's partly why I, I guess I've always been attracted to the 19th century um, and, um, you know, maybe a little bit what uh, Jarius Grove refers to as the Euro scene, this sort of um, uh, this historically specific and particular confidence that Europeans felt they um, both knew what the world uh, meant uh, and that that gave them the confidence to decide uh, what should happen uh, with people and with lands and with animals all around the world. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the ideas that have been most persistent in time and that remains as present as ever is that ele elephants are noble, that is, They're highly sensible, friendly to humans, even mystical in some reports, and also wise, that is extraordinarily intelligent and possessing a sharp memory. And this idea has a long history, dating back even to a Simbad story in Arabian Nights, and especially since the translation of this work in the 18th century, first to French and then to every major European language. But this idea contrasts clearly with another notion that was particularly common in written memoirs of hunters, animal traders, circus managers from the mid-18th century through the early 20th, namely that Elephants are vicious monsters, the most abominable and feared living creature on earth. Can you tell us a little bit about the unfolding of these two competing narratives? Oh, thank you. Um, yes. Um, so I think, uh, I, I hope <laughs> um, that when uh, people see that kind of contrast, um, uh, between you know the elephant as noble and um, and 
um, peaceful um, and emotional and the elephant as dangerous and uh, deadly, um, um, they will also see uh, how those kinds of characterizations are um, rooted in human cultures uh, and human moments in time um, uh, and are being deployed for for certain kinds of reasons that are, you know, sort of connected to the philosophies of the of the moment, right? Um, I I I have written a little bit about something I call the enlightened elephant. This this like how the elephant became kind of a um, to some degree a kind of fascination for enlightened. Uh, enlightenment thought in the uh, 18th century. Um, and that's where partly this image of the elephant as uh, particularly wise, um, judicious, um, thoughtful, um, also passionate, uh, which is also within uh, enlightenment thought, um, really uh, takes hold. Um, and then this other image of the elephant as, as deadly and vicious growing out of the second half of the 19th century, the rogue elephant. The rogue elephant doesn't exist in Western thought in the 18th century, but it does exist in the second half of the 19th century, that potentially that there are elephants out there that are out to kill people. Um, and, um, and that is very much kind of an invention um, of um, of, a, of a colonial mentality, um, and uh, so I, um, yeah, I, I hope that when people see things like that, they'll also question some of their own assumptions um, about our. Uh, what we mean when we talk about elephant emotion today, elephant wisdom today. At some point in the book, I think I compare elephants to oak trees. Um, and um, I, I've always been struck by how often oak trees like elephants are characterized as particularly uh, wise and grave. Um, and, um, uh, and, and I think I say something like, I'm not sure... Uh, they they may well be, um, but uh, that uh, but why we think so is the sort of question that interests. Yeah, um, and this is related to another of the common places that Western cultures have had about elephants, namely that they have a special rapport to death, that they have spiritual lives which are uh, accounted for in the rituals when a member of the king dies or that as soon as they forebode their own death, they go hide in special places, sometimes described as elephant graveyards, but also that they cry their dead. Um, can you talk a little bit about this? Yeah. Um, uh, again, it's a very, very old story, um, something that is really attracted Westerner authors. And one should say that this book is sort of very um, uh, generally situated in Western thought. Um, and um, um, and I think that's a completely, you know, it's a, 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 a reasonable critique of it. It does not, it really engage much with um, uh, Indian authors or African authors um, uh, around elephant ideas, um, because again, I'm basically a European historian, and it's, it's where my work is. Um, and while I love to be in conversation with those people, it's not uh, it, people working in those areas. It's not really um, an area that I have the expertise in that I feel I can actually write in. So, um, in any case. Uh, yeah, the idea of the elephant graveyard, um, that's, that uh, became very important to me because I started going to um, uh, natural history museums and uh, photographing um, elephant bones in their collections. Um, this was sort of... Um, uh, a project I started. Um, in a way, it's it's it it is incomplete. Uh, I'm still th thinking about it a little bit. Um, but I, I ended up um, uh, uh, with a collaborator going to uh, various collections um, and spending quite a bit of time just photographing the bones that are kept in collections um, uh, and uh, some of these collections. For example, the 
the Natural History Museum's uh, storage uh, facility um, in London, um, the elephant bone collection there just uh, it's really goes on and on. Um, and there's so many um, uh, remains um, in, in the collection. So um, I began to wonder about those kinds of places as elephant graveyards um, and uh, a different kind of elephant graveyard, one that elephants end up to not in, uh, end up in not by choice. Um, and um, but the the longer history of elephant graveyards um, uh, goes back uh, to uh, classical writers um, and. Um, and the idea that elephants um, understand the coming of their own deaths, understand what death is, um, and uh, and have a kind of um, understanding of religion and, and spirituality um, uh, has been very persistent. And uh, exactly where it comes from, uh, again, might be related to some of those ideas about wisdom um, and um uh, and it may it just come from um, empirical observations as well. There has certainly been, uh, I think a lot of people might be familiar with um, the films, especially of Echo um, uh, and others um, surrounding um, uh, elephant mourning rituals um, uh, that are sometimes described as elephant mourning rituals, um, and um, uh, so that is a is a sort of a, a strange little thread uh, in the scientific literature that um, that also really interested me. Um, Ian Douglas Hamilton describes it. Um, Joyce Poole describes it. Others have described um, elephants coming across the bones of um, deceased elephants and responding to them in ways that um, they feel are very different from how elephants respond to other kinds of bones and objects in the in the environment. Um, uh, I have, I can say a couple of things from personal experience. I have definitely seen elephants suffering from grief. Um, and I describe an elephant who uh, was very important to me, who suffered uh, deeply from um, the loss of a companion. Um, but um, uh, the, the sort of scientific basis for um, things like um, elephant tears, which is something that has been described over centuries, um, uh, and uh, and and the way that elephants do or do not respond uh, to elephant bones in particular ways, that is a is a very uh, fraught literature, actually, from my perspective. Um, it's uh, pretty much far from conclusive about anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, mourning is different than crying, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, I liked that. I think uh, what Jeffrey Mason and Susan McCarthy in their book "When Elephants Weep" said something like, um, uh, "You know, uh, tears are not themselves grief. They're uh, they're sort of uh, they are an outcome of grief, and their interest is more in the possibility of of grief." Um, and that strikes me as a really um, a wise way to think about it in a way, right? It's like um, uh, just because you know somebody uh, who is not crying does not mean that they're um, not suffering. Mm -hmm. And you can also cry and not be suffering. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, and I think this is one of the points um, where uh, your thesis is uh, made more explicit uh, that the, the um, Western mentalities uh, try to see in in um, you know something like uh, an elephant things that they feel is important and interesting, and um, so it would be of course extraordinary if we found an animal, uh, a non-human animal that could actually shed tears and i think this is one of the of the things this is one of the reasons why um it's been so persistent 
this uh, kind of myth of um, elephant tears. I think you're right. I think um, while you were talking, I was thinking a little bit about the mirror, the mirror recognition test, right? That uh, elephants, uh, it is argued, are one of the animals that are able to uh, understand that they are looking at themselves in a mirror. Um, something I also discuss um, in in the book. But the other part, I think, of a mirror uh, with the elephant is that it's it uh, it's always it's so often reflecting um, uh, what we want to see. Um, and I there's uh, <laughs> I, I, you know I because I I've always visited zoos and um, and I and I listen to um, people visiting zoos and I talk to keepers. Um, uh, one of the archives of this book is is just the is conversations with keepers I've known um, over over many years and um, yeah uh, <laughs> it, it's always striking to me um, how people think they see something um, happening and then you ask someone else and they're like oh, that's not what that is that's something completely different. Um, there's a there's a story, uh, and I won't name names, but there's a there was a video I was I was sent once of um, uh, of some people um, playing guitar on the back of an elephant, um, on the backs of several elephants. They were on a, a sort of a forest adventure uh, with elephants as a, a touristic thing, and they were playing guitars and. And the video purported that the elephants were singing with the with the musicians, and um, and the elephants were all squeaking like mad, and um, and and they sang more and more because it was so they were having so much fun. And look, the elephants are singing with us. Well, the elephants were terrified. If you like present that video to people who work with elephants, they're like, oh my gosh, those elephants are freaking out. Um, and they don't know what that sound is. And it's amazing. They're, they're not just running away in fear. So that's this moment of, um, you know, uh, uh, misunderstanding. Yeah, and uh, that's one of the um, points where critics like the positions of critics and the positions of people that have worked closely with elephants uh, differ so greatly right can you talk about um you know these two uh, opposing positions and how you develop them in your um in your book well um People who've read um, work I've written before um, know that I uh, can be quite critical of um, of zoos, um, but not necessarily in the ways that other people might be. Um, uh, for me, I, I I sometimes struggle making sort of very generalized statements that you know all zoos are bad or something like that. Um, the reason I there are lots of reasons I I do that I suppose uh, one is in the case of elephants um, there are something like 300 elephants in captivity in the United States um, and um, and honestly the quality of their life um, uh, of their lives is very different from place to place and uh, and the uh, one of the real um, measures of the quality of, of lives that they have has to do with the kind of social world, um, in my opinion, has to do with the social world that they have around them. That can include other elephants, and sometimes it will uh, only include people. Um, and um, and um, and I think I want to say that the, sometimes the quality of those relationships can be quite important and quite profound. And when an animal lives um, for decades um, and uh, longer than most people will um, uh, have as a career <laughs> at a zoo, um, uh, there can be a very significant 
uh, relationships that they have with uh, keepers. It's very difficult for me to characterize those people as evil or as um, sadistic or cruel or something like that when I know them and I know that they have devoted themselves in ways that I certainly couldn't um, to um, taking care of, of another creature, um, their physical, emotional uh, needs. Um, just helping an elephant in captivity with its physical needs is such a task. It's such a huge task uh, in the limited circumstances that so many elephants have in zoos to keep them clean, to try to keep them as healthy as possible, um, and to keep them um, uh, intellectually and emotionally um, stable in, in a very challenging circumstance. Um, and, you know, the success is uneven, <laughs> uh, one has to say, um, but um, uh, the effort that I have seen over decades of people uh, trying their best uh, themselves in challenging circumstances um, uh, uh, makes me admire them uh, because uh, um, I wrote a Book a few years ago with a colleague, um, Dick Blau, who's a photographer and filmmaker, and um, it was called Elephant House, and it was um, it was the result of us uh, visiting uh, an elephant collection uh, at the uh, Oregon Zoo in Portland, Oregon, um, over the course of several years, and spending time with the keepers and spending time with the elephants, and I, I. Um, I mean, I have to say the project started a little bit as a, a kind of a humorous comment uh, to um, to my friend Dick. I said something like, have you ever thought of shooting an elephant? Which is a reference to the George Orwell story, but he's a photographer and and, um, and he didn't know the story. So I, I gave him the story and, um, and uh, and the more we talked about it, the more excited he got about the idea of photographing an elephant. Actually, photographing an elephant poses all kinds of logistical problems. They don't fit very well in a camera. Um, and, um, and so what tends to happen when people start photographing elephants is that they tend to sort of zoom in very close to skin or to eyes or other parts of bodies um, and um, uh, and really sort of um, get excited about the formal characteristics or the formal elements of of, of a body uh, and um, so it took us it took quite a while for his work to develop in that context as well as mine uh, watching him work um, and then uh, working with the keepers and getting to know them better um, so it was a, a kind of a fascinating experience for me um, but you know that's a place that has had a great deal of criticism over the years um, and um, uh, and so it, it, you know one has to when you engage in work like that it was it was with it was Kind of fully knowing uh, that this is a politically charged issue. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to go back to the subject of images uh, a little bit later, but I would first like you to tell us um, from all the stories that kind of configure this one um, history that you are proposing. Uh, stories of Gonda, of Alice, of uh, Ned, of uh, that later became Tusco, um, of Lily. Is there one story that is closest to you that you would like to tell us about? Uh, gosh. Um. When I was doing the index, I think I counted 45 elephants named in the book um, and many more not named. Um, I think the book is dedicated, let me just open it, to a list of elephants. Um, it says, in memory of Gunda, Alice, Josephine, Ned, Nina, Packy, Lily, and many more with and without names. 
um, that's a pretty good list <laughs> of elephants who um, uh, really um, uh, impacted this project. Um, and um, uh, interesting omission in this list is the elephant who started the project. Um, and um, but of these, um, oh gosh, I think I would have to say um, if I were to pick one, um, it might be Packy. Um, and Packy maybe only appears on one or two pages of the book. Um, yeah, because I don't even remember her. <laughs> yeah, he's he's not, but uh, but Packy's a special one. Um, uh, Packy uh, was born in April 1962, um, and I was born in 1962 <laughs> in July. And when I was a child, um, I remembered um, uh, reading in sort of children's nature magazines um, about this elephant that had been born in the United States. When Packy was born, he was the first elephant born in the United States in decades, I think over 40 years. It's not that elephants, you know, are particularly difficult to... I mean, it's not. I should say it's not that people have been trying to have elephant um, um, babies uh, during that period, uh, because it was just honestly much simpler to import them from wherever you want, um, and there weren't that many male elephants in captivity uh, because of uh, challenges that uh, male elephants in particular have in captivity. Um, but anyway, I remembered Packy uh, when I was from from my, reading about Packy from when I was a kid. Uh, when I eventually met Packy, um, uh, we uh, were in our fifties, um, and um, uh, and Packy had had um, one could see parts of. Packy's history literally on his body um, and um, in, in, you know, and he was a very big elephant. Um, <laughs> I hadn't been around many male elephants before. Packy was a male Asian elephant um, and um, uh, he was probably the tallest elephant uh, in North America when he was alive. Um, and times uh, he was probably in the oh sort of 12 to 14 thousand pound range he was a very big elephant but not a i've seen more massive elephants uh since meeting him but i i've never met one taller um i just have to say there was something about packy uh which made me understand religion in different ways i am not a spiritual person i'm not a religious person um and um uh, I grew up in a very secular home, and uh, when I spent time with Packy, I began to understand, I think, a little bit more about elephants and temples, uh, and um, and uh, why um, it makes sense uh, to think about elephants um, in the same sort of thoughts as uh, thoughts about truth uh, and uh, and and even uh, some fairly big religious ideas. So those were some lessons that I learned from Hackey. Um, uh, there was he had a he had an extraordinary presence. And um, when you talk about male elephants uh, and their problems or the problems that they um, that they cause in certain contexts. I couldn't help thinking about male humans as well. How do these two um, presences, um, you know, play together? And uh, how was the image of the male elephant uh, used to, um, you know, ennoble the spirit of certain males? A uh, human males. Uh, so the 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 kind of obvious um, 
target, if you will, in all of that uh, is uh, someone like Theodore Roosevelt um, uh, um, and this kind of quest to test himself that he had to test himself against what he considered um, perhaps the most dangerous, but the uh, not the most dangerous uh, for him, but 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 the most challenging elephant uh, animal to hunt. Um, I think he felt that um, a wounded um, l- uh, large cat could be much more dangerous than an elephant, um, than a wounded elephant. However, um, certainly his goal of um, hunting elephants um, was in part about testing his manhood against what he considered a kind of ultimate um, challenge. Um, he, his, was a, his was an obsession uh, that uh, uh, was shared by others uh, in uh, the period of the um, of the great white hunters, a period, as far as I can tell, that continues to today. Um, and um, uh, so, uh, yeah, um, being able to successfully um, pursue and um, kill, uh, with, in his case, a very large gun, um, an elephant, um, was a way of, um, I think, of, uh, of uh, clarifying for himself uh, his um, uh, part of the meaning of his existence. And um, this is not a, uh, an intellectual or, or emotional uh, register that makes a great deal of sense to me. Um, uh, it, it is a, it's one that I, I recognize uh, and, I, and I know it's not uh, gone in the world, um, but it's one that does um, really, uh, I think it's had a kind of profound effect on the planet. Um, and so it's certainly one that I wanted to engage in. Um, you know, this book uh, has a kind of melancholy tone all the way through. And um, and I, I think I sort of felt a little bad about it at the end. You know, we're kind of used to there being something um, that lifts us up in, uh, in nature documentaries. They've sort of dealt with that problem. Uh, it can't all be about, like, you know, killing elephants or something. Um, uh, and I didn't want the book to be about that. I certainly didn't want the book to be about the spectacle of death. Um, uh, uh, that's not where my worker ideas are right now. Um, but um, um, I think you're right uh, that there's a uh, there's a there's a world of gender uh, that that is in all of this as well. I'll just say one more thing about that. I mean, if you think about um, elephant keepers and zoos, one of the really extraordinary things over the last 50 years is that um, is how many more women are um, uh, responsible for elephants in collections um, than it used to be. It used to be a hundred percent what they call themselves elephant men um, and um, and the practices of managing elephants in captivity um, and the people and their ideas and why they're doing it have been sort of remarkably changing over the last decades. Yeah, that's also clear with some images of elephants, for example, with children and with women, right? Like this image with uh, Helen Keller and how she described uh, Alice, I think, the, the elephant as, a, as the kindliest of creatures. And how, you know, there's also like a different take on not only, uh, you know, this gendered um conception of elephants but also how they have been used in imagery and um, publicity uh, etc yeah um, 
well, that picture of of Alice um, with Helen Keller is, a, is just fantastic, um, and um, um, I'm happy to say that was one I, I proposed for the cover. I was like, I mean, this is such an amazing picture. Um, again, because um, because she was blind, um, and um, and she's touching this elephant, um, and um, I I actually truly believe that the photograph was partially arranged because of the story of um, of the blind man and the elephant. Um, but it becomes much more in her hands and and in her discussion of her day at the zoo, um, uh, the Bronx Zoo. And um, so, yeah, I that photograph, um, obviously there's a long tradition of us, of us by, by this I mean, <laughs> Not me personally, but of of um, people who visited zoos and other kinds of collections over this over the last couple of centuries of putting their children on the backs of elephants. Um, one of the most sort of strangely improbable things, if you think about it, it's like, I mean, I mean, I mean, if if it's bad enough to stick your kid on the back of a horse, um, sticking them on the back of an elephant, I, you just kind of have to wonder. Um, uh, who, who thought this was a good idea? Um, I, I, I have an acquaintance uh, who I met once. Uh, we had been corresponding, and, and uh, we arranged to meet at a cafe in London um, when I happened to be in England. And, and he brought with him these huge um, uh, photo albums, uh, and one was just of himself as a child on the backs of uh, of all these elephants because he was just obsessed by them and and he was also obsessed with the whole kind of imagery around uh, children uh, riding elephants and it was just it was just extraordinary day uh, of talking about his his life um, but um, yeah uh, you know one of the the elephants in the book Gunda um, was brought really to be a ride elephant and the, there's a there's a photograph of Gunda in um, in the book with children on his back and um, uh, in front of Lake Agassiz uh, at the uh, Bronx Zoo just a fantastic picture and one that you know you can pick up today they were produced in so many copies uh, at the time and um, yeah so I wanted to talk about that and and do um, and um, I um, I think that uh, the the you know how uh, how that kind of image is also related to certain kinds of children's stories we have about elephants. Um, uh, I mean, obviously Babar, but um, but also uh, you know even Horton and a few other elephants who have um, been part of um, uh, our the way children um, have. Um, so many children have been raised to think about elephants um, is something that I, I, I definitely wanted to talk about. I was glad that Babar made an appearance in the book. Um, and um, I didn't know, you know, in so many cases in writing this, you know, who or what was going to end up in it. I think one of the strange things about this book for me is that I've been writing and thinking about elephants for 20 years. And so when I wrote this, I... Um, I literally just started on page one and wrote to the end, and I didn't know which stories would actually end up in it um, as I as I wrote it. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a, a, a fascination, kind of an, an inherent fascination that uh, people have with elephants, partly because they're... Um, the character, like the imaginal character of elephants, the way that they have this monumental presence uh, and that, as you say, they're so difficult to frame in a camera. I think uh, this is part of um, the um, kind of aura that they transmit of power and, uh, um, yeah, just size and weight and... And the fact that um, they have been used as, um, you know, uh, writing devices, right? That children have uh, been on and are uh, being placed on their backs is 
it's uh, precisely because of this um the image power of that uh is like really really striking I think I say somewhere in here that uh, we may be hardwired in our brains to um, to um, pause when we see an elephant. Um, there's uh, the fact that um, uh, proboscideans are on the walls of prehistoric caves <laughs> and in rock art um, in Asia and Africa um, and uh, and ubiquitous um, in the internet <laughs> um, might be a clue that um, we can't not look at elephants and wonder. Yeah, and be amazed. That's right. Um, I thought one of the most uh, complicated um, narratives uh, of your book uh, that's also part of, of our most present ideas about um, elephants today is the fact that some hunters were also conservationists and they talked about uh, the possibility of extinction. Can you just briefly talk about this? Um, sure. Uh... I live in the Midwest. <laughs> we don't have a lot of elephants that are wild here, um, but uh, we are on a flyway uh, for uh, for waterfowl. Um, it's hard not to notice uh, in Wisconsin where I live the connections between conservation and hunting. Um, that so many of the um, uh, lands that have been preserved um, and that make the lives of ducks possible uh, in a sort of shrinking environment um, have been set aside by hunters. And, um, and um, that history also plays out um, with elephants. It's undeniably the case that some of the uh, strongest proponents of establishing parks um, very much after a model of 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 land um, control uh, and management based on certain kinds of European models, um, uh, but the establishment of these parks in Africa and other places that were partly set aside to protect elephants were. Um, um, pushed strongly by hunters who um, were not um, necessarily um, uh, market hunters uh, and were not necessarily ivory hunters, but were um, sort of typically sport hunters or scientific collectors. Um, and um, so one has to uh, somehow acknowledge the connections between um, the the wishes um, and um, desires of hunters to preserve the hunt and to preserve the opportunity to be in nature with animals and their conservation. That's true today too with, uh, with um, uh, various um, ways that states use licensing fees as uh, conservation tools. Um, and also um, in the case of uh, um, uh, some places also using now, you know, sort of tourist dollars uh, as a way of generating um, and tourism is, has its own kind of relationships to the use of, of nature. Um, so those, those I think, are all um, kind of intermingled. Uh, 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 it's, one can't deny that um, there, there might not be elephants walking around today were it not for some very outspoken people who were hunters of elephants um, and who, um, who set aside, um, who had the political power um, and um, uh, and connections to have large tracts of land set aside. One could, you know, make a really good argument that um, that um, was not really necessarily 
driven by a kind of tree hugging mentality that <laughs> that uh, that people might uh, often associate um, uh, perhaps incorrectly with um, conservation, uh, but it's an it was an older um, an older vision um, that is that's still important. So um, yeah. Again, I don't hunt. Um, I certainly talk to hunters in the process of this project as well um, and talk to people who have uh, hunted elephants uh, as part of this project. Um, and um, uh, so um, trying to understand their perspective and and what it is they want in, uh, in their experience of the world is, is part of what was driving the project as well. Yeah, um, I, I think in this point, as well as others, um, you echo um, two of the seminal books in animal studies. Uh, the first one is uh, Derrida's um, The Animal That Therefore I Am, which uh, in its original um, title plays with the word Uh, being, I mean, uh, je suis as uh, I am and je suis as I follow. So um, I think uh, Derrida is also playing with this idea that what we are following when we are studying or talking about animals is actually ourselves, the beings that we are. And then the other um, text is uh, Vinciane Despre, um, as she um, asks, what would animals say if we asked the right questions, uh, or at least other questions that have more to do with the lives of these specific animals and their interactions and affordances, and what would happen, what kinds of elephants would bloom in our thoughts if we shifted our attention towards their interests and practices. And I think uh, the best example of this problem is uh, materialized in Carl Ackerley's sculpture, The Alarm, um, which is a depiction of a classic nuclear family. Uh, I would even say a classic American pie family, uh, which is presented, uh, and I quote, sensing but standing up to danger, sensing the hunter, sensing perhaps their own destruction. This is one of the images that I found most staggering in your book, along with the photograph used in Schilling's book, The Spell of the Elele Show, and uh, also Gonda with his trainer. So uh, one last question would be uh, if you can talk about these images and how images of elephants and things like cages, chains, ribbons, pink tutus, and people like men and women and children in strikingly different positions and gestures have contributed to the configuration of uh, what the, our common notions about elephants in Western cultures. Um, like, uh, I think these images um, are framed in certain ways with words, but also are used as framing devices for certain discourses. So can you say a few words about that? Um, maybe we should book a whole hour uh, to talk about <laughs> that, um, because that was uh, such a fantastic question. Um, and and I can say that no one has um, pointed to that image of the alarm um, uh, in talking to me about the book yet. So I want to thank you for that. Um, certainly the, the photograph you mentioned of Gunda um, with his keeper is one that um, I think you're referring to the, the last photograph I have of Gunda um, is one. Um, uh, I mean, the book, uh, I was going to say, is one that's very important to me. Um, the book is, is uh, I think, in all my work, uh, I work with a lot of images. Uh, I think there might be something like 50 or so in this book. Um, and um, And that's, uh, I, in my practice, in my work, I, I tend to start with an image um, that 
confuses me in some way um, that uh, that leaves me with a question um, and um, and uh, I think that's that's you know <laughs> um, that's a that's a technique that's a that's that's a um, that's the way I approach uh, my work and I and I've always done it that way I like an artifact to begin with um, and it's usually an image although sometimes it's a text but it's usually an image and I like to spend time um, really looking carefully as uh, within without it becoming too much um, uh, at, at images um, and uh, you know your your connections to um, Derrida and uh, Despre. I think um, th I want to thank you for that. I this is um, as a writer. I don't talk about other uh, uh, other people writing in my field. Um, there are references to people in my notes, but they're not in the text. And um, it's just a it's just. I, I like to write to an audience that doesn't know the literature, but I want people who know the the literature to read the book and go, oh, well, there's that connection and there's that connection because they're in my mind. I just don't want to make them explicit. Um, and, you know, going back to our beginning of our discussion, I mean, uh, when we were talking a little bit before um, this, we were talking about dissertations and books, and that's one of the joys of writing a book versus a dissertation, right? As in a dissertation, you have to make all that explicit, um, and in a book, you don't have to um, uh, if you don't if that's not the work you want to do. So um, uh, I know we don't have much time, but I'll just say. Um, I think the images are absolutely central to this whole book and the whole project. Um, I wanted the images to be a kind of um, uh, um, an album. An album is such a uh, is a, such a wrong concept because that, that's a, a kind of collecting and a kind of owning and a kind of personal memoir, which I. I don't really want the book to be, um, but um, but it is a personal book, uh, and these pictures, uh, the photographs, really do matter to me. Um, and if you write about elephants, your options are endless uh, for for images, and to 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 be able to select the ones that are meaningful to you um, uh, uh, is uh, is is part of the pleasure. So I'll leave it there. Well, Nigel, um, I think we have taken a lot of your time, so I will just ask you, what are you working on now? Butterflies. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Slightly um, different. I, uh, or not. <laughs> um, it's turning out that I will be writing about some of the most charismatic butterflies that have ever existed. So um, maybe it's the same story. Um, uh, and um, but it's a it's a book about um, it's it's a book project, and I started it about um, 15 years ago. Uh, it's just been kind of. Um, maybe just floating around uh, uh, as I've been working on this one and now I'm turning to it properly. Um, and um, yeah, it's about, uh, it's about butterflies uh, and the late 19th century and, um, and colonial uh, fantasies uh, and passions and, um, and, uh, and what we're to make of it a hundred years on. That sounds like an exciting project, and I would. It'll keep me busy uh, for a few years. <laughs> yeah, I would sure like to see some of its outcomes. Um, I really want to thank you for being on the show today. I really enjoyed it. Uh, Marcella, it was a real pleasure, um, and thank you for reading the book with such attention and and, uh, and care. I really enjoyed this very much. <laughs> Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. And thank you for listening to the New Books Network podcast. Bye. <laughs>